Greetings and welcome. I love iodine with another video in my series on intestinal parasites. This video is going to cover antiparasitic and antifungal herbs. The other topics that are included in this video series are listed here. You will find videos covering these topics in the intestinal parasites playlist. The information provided is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare provider. This information is not to be used or relied upon for any diagnostic or treatment purposes. I'm not a medical practitioner and I'm not offering any medical advice. The herbs and the claims made about specific herbs in this document and this presentation may not have been evaluated, evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease and or make any claims thereof. The information provided is based upon my personal experiences and upon years of extensive research. We'll be covering various herbs that have antiparasitic or antifungal properties. I want to make some clarifications about this presentation. Some of the herbs that we'll be discussing should not be used with the other herbs in this video. The herbs that I'll be listing are not meant to be taken or seen as a protocol. Many of the herbs that are listed may have interactions with other herbs that go beyond the scope of this video. They also may interact with certain foods and they may interact with certain medications, whether they be pharmaceutical or over the counter. Some of the herbs in this presentation are for short term use. Certain herbs are not for certain people. This is especially true for pregnant women, women that are breastfeeding, or for children or the elderly. Please consult a qualified herbalist or healthcare provider for guidance, and please do your own research. It is known that a healthy diet and lifestyle are important for longevity and vitality. It is absolutely essential when doing any detoxification protocol. Some antiparasitic herbs may act as broad spectrum antimicrobials. Thus, these herbs may kill off some of your beneficial flora. How I dealt with the loss of beneficial flora is I consumed lots of probiotic rich foods when doing any cleanse or detoxification protocol. That's necessary to maintain normal gut flora as much as possible. I also ate extra probiotic rich foods after in order to restore any beneficial bacteria that may have been lost. In addition, I consumed nutrient dense foods to boost my body's immune system and support my liver, kidneys and other organs. The herbs that I'll be discussing in this video include this list and a few more that are going to be covered at the end. I'll be discussing uh, various types of wormwood. I'll be talking about Artemisia absinthium, which is commonly just called wormwood. Artemisia annua is known as sweet wormwood. There's another species of Artemisia called Artemisia vulgaris, which is commonly called mugwort. I'll be discussing American worm seed, black walnut, pardoco, clove, cayenne, cinnamon, cardamom, thyme, nutmeg, mace, plantain, that's the plantain herb, not the plantain like the banana, ginger, turmeric, Mediterranean oregano, Mexican oregano, olive leaf, echinacea, golden seal, gold thread, organ grape, barberry, coriander seeds, fennel seeds, caraway seeds, cumin seeds, carom seeds, Carom seeds is often used with jaggery or Indian black salt as part of an Ayurvedic protocol. I'll also be discussing black cumin seeds, which is not actually related to the previously discussed cumin seeds. We'll talk about that further. I'll be discussing neem leaf, sage, and an herb called centaury. Here's a list of the foods that are naturally antiparasitic or have antifungal properties. These are covered in a separate video. I just wanted to present these here in case somebody was wondering why I left garlic off of this list, but I did cover it in the food. So if you're interested in learning more about garlic, onions, the fresh ginger and the fresh turmeric, and the other foods, including pineapple, papaya, pomegranates, grapefruits, fresh figs, blackberries, cranberries, coconuts, beets, carrots, pumpkin seeds, and other squash seeds as well, plantain, cayenne and other hot peppers, fennel, that includes the actual plant and the seeds, horseradish and wasabi, fenugreek, that includes the sprouts and the seeds, and radishes. The first herb I'll be discussing is Artemisia absinthium. Wormwood is classified as an unsafe herb by stone and its derivatives. Wormwood is an odorous perennial shrub that's native to Europe and it's been naturalized in many parts of the United States and Canada. The name wormwood is derived from the ancient use of the plant in its extracts as an intestinal anthematic. You'll also see anthematic listed as anti-helmetic, anti-parasitic, a vermifuge, or vermicide. These are all rather synonymous, so if you see any of those, just 
basically um, understand it's discussing that it can kill parasites. In this instance, uh, helminths, we know from looking at the other videos, that refers to the parasitic worms. And if we're looking at protozoa, that's the single-celled parasitic organisms, just as a clarification. One thing to note is the essential oil of wormwood is toxic. It is not for internal use. Be careful with that. No form of this herb is for long-term use. This herb is not to be used by pregnant or breastfeeding women. There's many available forms of this herb. You can get the dried herb and you can make teas or tinctures. You can actually get tinctures that are prepared. Often they are prepared with other antiparasitic herbs as a combination. And you can find it in capsules in much the same way. And you can find it fresh as it grows wild in many parts of the United States. Sweet wormwood. This is known as Artemisia annua. This is a safer uh, type of wormwood. It also has a lot of other benefits and it has been shown to be anti-malarial and cytotoxic to cancer cells. It has antibacterial, antiparasitic, and antifungal properties. Sweet wormwood is an odorous annual shrub that's native to Asia and it's been naturalized in the United States. Again, even though it's safer than Artemisia absinthium, if you are pregnant or breastfeeding, this is not an herb that you would want to be using in, at all. It's also not recommended for long-term use. The available forms are going to be the same as the RDBC absinthium, the dried herb that you can use as a tea or make your own tincture. You can actually find tinctures. This is usually one you can find as a solo ingredient commercially. You can also get it in capsules and you can find it fresh as it grows wild. Another related species of Artemisia is Artemisia vulgaris, commonly called mugwort. I want to make a clarification. It's very important to know the botanical names because if you would read more on sweet wormwood, which is also known as sweet annie, it's actually called annual mugwort and annual wormwood. So be very careful with actually knowing the distinction because in certain areas they will refer to the plant by its common name. And it, like I said, it's very important to know the actual Latin or the botanical name to make sure that you're getting the herb that you want. That's why it's very important to work with a qualified herbalist because they will be very familiar with, of course, the botanical names. Mugwort is also available in the same forms that we've already discussed. We have the dried herb. We can have tinctures, capsules, or you can find it fresh as it grows wild in many places as well. It aids in digestion and helps with intestinal health. It's a beneficial effect on the bowel production, which will help with um, digestion and nutrient assimilation. It acts as a mild purgative, which is very important if you're trying to purge parasites outside of your body, and thus it expels parasites. If you're pregnant or breastfeeding, this is not an herb that you would want to be using, and it's also not recommended for long-term use. Another thing that mugwort is known for is it is known to cause lucid dreaming. Be careful, as that sounds like a very delightful thing, it can actually have some consequences that you would not like. It disrupts your sleep cycle. More time is spent in REM sleep and one does not achieve deep sleep stages. Thus, over time, you can become sleep deprived and if you are sleep deprived, your immune system will not function properly and it can also cause things like overeating and fatigue, which has been shown in many research studies. Mugwort is also known to be used in various magical witch worlds. American worm seed. This is an herb that I just became acquainted with recently, so I'm very interested to um, use it more. It is in the family, in the amaranth family. It was commonly classified in a different family, so you will see that it actually has two um, botanical names. So you might see it in the literature as either one. It's known as Episode, Jesuit's Tea, Mexican Tea, and a few other names. Keep in mind that there is an oil made from this plant and it is called chinopodium oil, but it is not the same thing as worm seed oil that you would be making from Artemisia absinthium, where that oil is claimed to be extremely toxic and may be referred to as worm seed or European worm seed, and it also has many other names as well. Again, I reiterate, it's very important to learn the botanical names to make sure that you can keep all of these clear and keep them all straight. So for more information, you can see the slide on wormwood again and that will provide a little more information. There is some toxicity concerns even with the chinopodium oil, but despite this, it is still used to kill roundworms and hookworms, especially in livestock and farm animals. I'm sure that many humans still use it as well. This is a plant that's native and very common in Mexico, so that is probably something that the locals use. This is not for use if someone is pregnant or breastfeeding, and it's not recommended for long-term use. 
that said, um, this can be used as a culinary herb, and that would be a different story. But when you're taking an herb and you're making an extract, whether it be a tincture or you're consuming large doses of it, then you can get into some areas where it can become risky and there can be toxicity issues. So be very careful and make sure that you know what you're doing and do your research and speak with someone that's qualified to be able to deal with parasitic infections and the herbs that can be used to treat them. Interesting, there is a plaque here on the right hand side of your screen and it is, speaks in Spanish and it talks about episode and it talks about that it's used as a culinary herb or seasoning condiment and it's used for parasites and it's originating uh, from Mexico and it's cultivated um, is widespread. So that's my very terrible interpretation of Spanish, but that is basically the gist of what it's talking about there. People may be familiar with some other plants that are in the amaranth family. That's going to include lamb's quarter, which is known as wild spinach, amaranth of course, which grows wild, but you can find it in the store as well. It makes a nice um, gluten-free grain and it's high in protein. And also quinoa is in this family as well. In the available forms, you can find it as a dried herb, whether that's the whole leaf and stem, and you can use that for teas or for culinary uses. It is used in a lot of um, Mexican um, dishes as a seasoning. It is very pungent, so you would only use a small amount. And it can be used to make tinctures or used in capsules if one were using it for intestinal problems. And obviously, it can be wild harvested as it does grow wild in Mexico. Black walnut is another herb that has been shown to be very effective in dealing with parasites, especially with worms. This is a tree that's native to North America. So you, if you're lucky, you have one growing near you and you can actually harvest the black walnuts in the halls in the late summer, early fall, and as well, the leaves as well. The black walnut hall contains a substance called jugulone and tannins and iodine. And this combo is a potent elixir that is toxic to harmful organisms. The medicinal benefits are concentrated in the green hall and to a lesser degree in the leaves as well. The available forms that you can buy, you can buy the powdered dried herb. You can also find tinctures of black walnut, commercial, or of course you can make your own. You can find capsules of the dried herb, and of course you can get the fresh leaf in season. Black walnut has been shown to have antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and anti-helmintic and anti-parasitic properties. It's a potent detoxifier, intestinal cleanser, and it has been shown to oxygenate the blood and help regulate blood sugar. Pardoco. Pardoco is known primarily for its antifungal benefits. So as we read here, it's known for its antibiotic, disinfectant, antifungal, and expectorant properties. The tree's inner bark is harvested to make into tea or into powder for herbal formulations like tinctures or capsules. There's a warning that this may intensify the blood thinning effects of various anticoagulant medications. You can see the website pardoco.org for more information. This herb has been used for centuries by the native tribes of South America as well as the ancient Incas and Aztecs. There are many constituents that actually show that this is very effective for eliminating fungal infections and certain parasites and you can find this in various forms including the dried herb, packaged teas, tinctures, and capsules. Clove is a very effective agent in killing parasitic eggs. There's many available forms that you can get. You can get, of course, the whole clove bud, which is what I prefer. You can get ground cloves. Um, I do not uh, encourage that because if you do it yourself, then you retain the volatile oils. As the herbs are ground and they sit on the shelf for weeks, months, maybe years, a lot of the volatile oils may dissipate, especially if you have it sitting on your shelf for a long period of time and you keep opening the jar, then these things are going to get lost and they will diminish. You can also find it in a tincture. You can make tinctures yourself as well. You can find it in capsules, and of course you can find clove oils and essential oil. I recommend that only for topical use. I'm not of uh, the persuasion that I think that consuming essential oils internally is a good idea, but other people disagree with me, and that of course is up to them to do so. But for me, I steer clear of that. Clove's been shown to be antibacterial, antiparasitic, antiviral, antifungal, antimicrobial, antiseptic, Again, it's the oil and cloves that destroys and kills parasitic eggs, and that's absolutely key because if you're taking herbs that are killing the adult form or the larval form, these herbs typically don't do much for the eggs. So clove is typically, 
In fact, by typically, I mean, I've never not seen it in a parasite cleanse kit. And Dr. Holda Clark had clove, wormwood, and black walnut as her three herbs that were essential for dealing with parasites. Clove is high in a substance called eugenol, and this is a powerful germicidal agent. So what clove does is these the compounds, they go through your bloodstream and they'll kill microscopic parasites and parasitic larvae and eggs. It's very key because we do have a lot of bloodborne parasites that are single celled and they're not just living in our intestinal tract. So it's nice that the parts of clove can actually address the parasites that are in different parts of our body. There's a caution with clove that might slow blood clotting. And like I said before, fresh ground clove buds are preferred and what you can do is if you have the whole clove buds, they can be ground in a spice or coffee grinder, or they can be added with other ingredients in smoothies and just put in your blender. Cloves are definitely um, something that you want to um, use on a regular basis. It's a very delicious spice and it has um, many health benefits. Cayenne pepper and other hot peppers are going to be very effective in dealing with parasites. As you can imagine, parasites can't handle the heat of the pepper and that will burn them. Um, I do recommend being very careful. There are some hotter peppers than cayenne and they can actually be a little questionable and actually can cause burning of the esophagus, especially things like ghost pepper or the scorpion pepper or the Carolina Reaper. Anyway, that being said, cayenne pepper has been known to be very beneficial for raising the metabolism and actually increases as a very warming spice. And it's available in various forms. You can find it, you know, dried and powdered. You can find the ground. You can actually find tinctures and capsules. There are some capsules out there that have the heat removed. I'm not so certain that they would be effective, but that's up to other people to try. I personally like spicy foods and um, I encourage, you know, I try to eat spicy foods every single day of my life. So there's various forms you can, now you can also have the fresh cayenne pepper as well, but I do cover that in the food section. This is one that's covered in both. Cinnamon, this is a very important one and it's a very delicious one as well. You can find cinnamon in various forms, including ground, dried sticks, tinctures, capsules, and extracts. There's two different cinnamons we need to talk about. There's Ceylon cinnamon, and then there's cassia cinnamon. And we will discuss that Ceylon is the only true cinnamon, whereas cassia cinnamon is high in a toxic substance that can cause liver and kidney damage. Yet this is the type of cinnamon you will find in a lot of over-the-counter supplements that are sold as cinnamon and that's supposed to be helpful in regulating blood sugar. So be very, very careful and be mindful of that because according to the European Food Safety Authority, there are guidelines on the tolerable daily intake. Their recommendations for a 110 pound person is a quarter cup would be safe for them to consume of Ceylon cinnamon. That's a lot of cinnamon. Whereas with cassia cinnamon, they can actually hit the toxicity level at just a small amount of a quarter teaspoon. That's not very much. So we need to be very careful that cassia cinnamon is high in the substance called um, cumarin, where Ceylon cinnamon is not. And cumarin is known to cause liver and kidney damage in high concentrations. So there is some information that may be um, helpful for other purposes. Another pungent spice is cardamom. It's in the ginger family and it has volatile essential oils that inhibit the growth of viruses, bacteria, fungus, and mold. It helps the body eliminate waste through the kidneys. There are two main types of cinnamon, or cardamom rather, pardon me. You have the true or the green, and then there's the black cardamom. I'm only familiar with the true cardamom, and maybe you're familiar with the black. If you find that that has anti-parasitic benefits, you can definitely leave that in the comments. I prefer the whole seed pods because when you grind cardamom especially, it loses its volatile oil content. So be mindful of that. And cardamom is a rather expensive spice, so you want to be getting the maximum benefit out of it. So of course, the available forms are the seed pods, or you can actually buy the seeds, which will be cheaper. And of course, you can get it ground, and that might be cheaper still. But you are losing a lot of the health benefits. You can find it in capsules, and you can actually find it as a tincture as well. Cardamom has been shown to combat nausea, help with acidity, bloating, gas, heartburn, loss of appetite, and help with relieving constipation. Thyme. Thyme is in the mint family. This pairs well with fenugreek seeds and sprouts. Thyme contains phytochemicals that guard against infection. It has been shown to be antibacterial, antifungal, 
and it helps with eliminating and preventing yeast infections. It's been shown to be anti-parasitic, especially against hookworms and roundworms, and it also aids in digestion. Thyme is native to southern Europe. It is slightly spicier than oregano and a little sweeter than sage, so you can add it to your culinary dishes. Thyme essential oil has been shown to boost mood. And this is very good because if you're dealing with a parasitic infection, that can actually cause some anxiety, irritability, and you to feel fatigue. That's known as die-off symptoms. I cover that in other videos. Thyme is very easy to grow at home if you're a gardener. If not, um, I would recommend maybe learning how to be a gardener. It's probably a wise idea. Available forms, of course, you can get the dried herb. You can find it in capsules. You can find thyme tea. You can have it in a tincture, or if you grow it at home, you can have the fresh leaf, or they do sell it in a lot of grocery stores in the produce section in a fresh form as well. Nutmeg and mace are used as a combination because these spices come from the same plant. It comes from a small evergreen tree, and both nutmeg and mace have a sedative effect. Nutmeg is the actual seed, and it's slightly, slight, slightly, ooh, wow, the pronunciation there, ooh, slightly sweeter than mace, whereas mace, which is the outer red covering, it has a more delicate flavor. Nutmeg essential oil has been shown to have anti-parasitic benefits against Toxoplasma gondii. The available forms, you can, of course, get the dried seed, and you can also get mace dried as well. You can get ground seed and you can get ground mace. You can find it in capsules, tinctures, and you can find it as an essential oil. Here are some scientific research supporting that nutmeg is effective in treating Toxoplasma gondii. I will be linking all of these research articles in the description of this video. Plantain, this is one of my favorite herbs. It grows wild, so you can get it for free. You can also find it in the store as a tincture, but let's just talk about this. This is across the United States. This is a weed, and I'm sure you probably have it growing near where you live, especially in the spring and the summer and into the fall. This is unrelated to the cooking plantain, which is a kind of banana. This plantain is in the genus Plantago, which includes psyllium, whose seeds are used to make psyllium husk powder that you may be familiar. It's used in Metamucil. So thus the seeds have a mucilaginous um, benefit and it helps coat the intestinal tract and it also helps serve as a bulk forming laxative. Plantago major, which is on the left hand side, is known as broadleaf plantain, white man's foot, common plantain, it's also known as greater plantain. Plantago lanceolata is on the right hand side and it's known as English plantain, narrow leaf plantain, ribwort plantain, rib leaf, it's also known as lamb's tongue. It's available in many forms, fresh as it grows wild, that's my favorite, and you can of course dry the leaf for future use, so you can harvest it in the summer and then you can dry it so you can have it all winter long. Once you dry it, you can of course powder it, you can make it into tinctures, you can put it in capsules if you don't like the taste of it, and of course you can make teas out of it, whether you're using the fresh or the dried herb. It has been shown to have anti-parasitic, antimicrobial, antioxidant, antifungal, and antibacterial properties. It is known that Plantain makes a potent skin ointment, or a salve, if you will. And this can be used for wounds, burns, bee stings, and also for fungal infections. The seeds and the leaves have been shown to be an effective vermifuge, and we know that that means it's anti-parasitic. So you don't have to just use the leaf. You can use the seed stock, you can use the seeds. All parts of this plant are edible, and I find it quite delicious. I do prefer the Plantago Major better for numerous reasons. There's a bigger leaf, and it just, it just seems more succulent. Ginger. Many people are familiar with ginger and ginger is quite delicious. It has been shown to have anti-helmetic properties and it has shown, been shown to be effective against protozoan parasites as well. It is effective against diarrhea caused by E. coli. It aids in digestion, bloating, indigestion, IBS, and flatulence. It helps with nausea. Many people will chew ginger gum if they actually have symptoms of nausea or for motion sickness. Ginger is also anti-inflammatory, and there's many forms that you can get. You can get the fresh rhizome, or some people would call that the root, but technically it is a rhizome, which is an underground stem. You can find underground form. You can find ginger tea. Of course, it's in capsules. There's ginger tinctures, and you can get the ginger oil as well. Ginger, gingerol is the active constituent of fresh ginger, and gingerol is cytotoxic to cancer cells. Whenever you actually dry the um, ginger, it actually has to be heated. 
And when it does, it actually has, the gingerol goes through a conversion and it becomes a new compound called um, zigerone. And that actually has different health benefits. And that actually has been shown to stimulate the release of catecholamines and helps aid in the breakdown of fats. So both the fresh and the dried have very different but very significant health promoting properties. Here's some scientific research showing that ginger, this is the gingerol, has been effective in treating the dwarf tapeworm. And here is some scientific research that discusses how ginger in combination with cinnamon has been used to treat giardia. Turmeric, this is related to ginger, they're in the same family. Many people are familiar with turmeric as it has been in the news recently because it has been shown to be extremely anti-inflammatory. This is the main spice that's used in many curries. It's also frequently used in mustards, butters, and cheeses as a coloring agent because turmeric contains a yellow colored phytochemical called curcumin. Curcumin is what's known to be the compound that has the anti-inflammatory benefits which is why you'll see it in store shells in a bottle. We know that it's anti-inflammatory and we know that turmeric also has anti-parasitic benefits. Turmeric can also be used as an enema for people with IBD because it does have anti-inflammatory uh, compounds and that will help cause the inflamed and irritated um, colon to actually have some benefit and some relief. There's many ways that you can get this. It's gonna be very similar to ginger, of course, the fresh rhizome. You can get it ground, you can get turmeric tea, you can have it as capsules, and you can have it as tinctures. If you're not familiar with golden milk, check into that. It's a very delicious thing, and turmeric is what gives it its lovely golden color. Turmeric's benefits are potentiated with piperine from black pepper, so make sure to add some ground black pepper. But be careful, I'm going to give a different side on this. I heard this in a different video where someone had suggested it would be beneficial not to add the black pepper at times because that would allow the anti-inflammatory benefits of the curcumin not to be absorbed and then that would have to go through your intestinal tract. Thus, if you were having issues with inflammation, IBS or IBD, that would actually allow for the curcumin to travel all the way through your small intestine down into your large intestine and that can help provide some anti-inflammatory benefits directly into your colon rather than all the good benefits being absorbed directly into your body. So definitely just have extra turmeric, have some with the ground black pepper and have some without. This is some scientific research showing that ginger and turmeric are effective in treating a roundworm called Ascaridia gali. This Roundworm is not as common in the United States as it is elsewhere, but it's something to be aware of. If, it, if we know that an herb is effective in treating one type of roundworm, it would be likely that that type of herb would be effective in treating similar types of roundworms. Next, we'll be discussing Mediterranean oregano. This oregano is in the mint family. It has been shown to be high in antioxidants and it's very good for immune system support. The oil of oregano has been purported to kill parasites, especially the blastocystis hominis and a few others, if you take oil of oregano for six weeks. We know that oregano has a lot of essential oils that have been shown to be antibacterial and antifungal. It's native to the Mediterranean region and according to the name, it's referred to as the delight of the mountains in Greek. Oil of oregano is taken orally for intestinal parasites. Oil of oregano can also be applied directly to the skin for athlete's foot or for ringworm conditions. Oil of oregano is also used topically as an insect repellent. It's available in different forms, including of course the oil, the dried herb, as capsules, as a tea or tinctures, or of course the fresh leaf, whether you grow it yourself or you can get it in the store. This is the one exception that I do make. I actually ingest oil of oregano. I get a, a nice brand that I really like and I use it rather frequently. And I use it in combination with olive leaf, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes. This is some scientific research showing that oregano has been used to treat giardia. Next, we're going to talk about Mexican oregano. What's interesting is Mexican oregano is actually in a different family than Mediterranean oregano, but they do have similar health benefits. Mexican oregano contains the essential oil of thymol and a few others that have been shown to be effective in treating parasites and treating fungus and also 
being antibacterial. This herb is native to the southwestern United States. If you look at the research study, we see that this oil here of Mexican oregano has been shown to be more effective against the parasitic amoeba Giardia than the actual drug that's being currently used to treat it. So that's something to consider. It has a stronger and less sweet flavor than Mediterranean oregano, but it is delicious nonetheless. Olive leaf. Olive leaf has antioxidant, antihypertensive, which means it helps with uh, blood pressure. It helps with inflammation. It's hypoglycemic, which helps regulate the blood sugar, and it helps lower cholesterol. It has compounds in it that have been shown to be antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and immune boosting. It's available in many forms. You can find it as a dried herb, as a tincture, as a tea, in capsules, or fresh leaf if you're lucky enough to live where olive trees grow naturally, where it's native. I live in Maryland. We don't have olive trees here. Olive leaf, like I said, pairs well with oregano and oil of oregano. Next up, we have a favorite of mine. This grows wild where I live. It's echinacea. This is very good for your immune system, and it's known as the purple cone flower. It's native to eastern North America, so if you're on the east coast, you might be having it grown in a field or in a area near you. The available forms, of course, is the dried herb. You can find it in capsules, tinctures, and teas, and of course, the fresh leaves and flowers. Echinacea has antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral benefits, as well as being immune boosting. It pairs well with golden seal, which we'll be talking about in a few moments. It's widely used to fight infections, especially the common cold, the flu, and other upper respiratory infections. There is a word of caution. Echinacea may cause allergic reaction in those who are allergic to ragweed, mums, marigolds, or daisies. So please consult your allergist, healthcare provider, or an herbalist and also consult them for any interactions this may have with current medications. One other note, echinacea also pairs well with elderberry. Elderberry is not known to be antiparasitic, but it's great for your immune system, and it does grow wild as well, if you're lucky enough to get it, but usually the birds actually eat the berries before most people can get to it. Next, we have golden seal. This is known to be very um, antiparasitic. It contains a compound in it called berberine. Berberine is very antifungal. This pairs well with echinacea, like I just discussed. Golden seal is very bitter, thus it stimulates the appetite and stimulates bowel secretion, thereby aiding in digestion. One concern with golden seal, it's over-harvested and threatened, so be very mindful about wild harvesting. The available forms that you can buy commercially, you can of course get the dried herb. It's available in capsules as a loose leaf that you can use for teas and you can get it as a tincture. And if you're lucky enough to have it growing in abundance where you live, you can also use the fresh leaf. Berberine is claimed to kill pathological organisms like candida albicans, and we know that's responsible for yeast infections. And it's also been shown to be effective in killing parasites such as tapeworms and giardia. Berberine may also activate white blood cells, making them better at fighting infections and strengthening the immune systems. Gold thread. This also contains berberine. It's called by many names like canker root, mouth root, yellow root, and golden thread. And that would be because it's actually helpful in uh, dealing with canker sores. It contains the bitter alkaloid berberine, just like golden seal and just like the next two uh, plants that we'll be discussing that are in the berberidaceae family. Gold thread has bright gold thread-like rhizomes, which is the underground stems, and these are used to make medicine. A species of gold thread is used as a medicinal herb in China and is a bitter tonic for treating malarial fever. We know that malaria is a, caused by a protozoan parasites that are transmitted by mosquitoes. Gold thread is used for digestive disorders, parasitic infections, and also for psoriasis. The available forms include a dried herb as a tea, capsules as tinctures or fresh if you can find it growing wild near where you live. The two plants in the Berberidaceae family include Oregon grape, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, and barberry, which is on the right-hand side. Both have high amounts of berberine, hence the name of the family. And nice thing where I live, I can find barberry growing wild so I can get the berries and actually eat them, and that's what I do as far as using barberry. This spring, I will maybe try to harvest some of the inner bark and at some point maybe deal with the root, but I haven't done that yet. I've only actually consumed the berries. Oregon grape, I've used as a tincture, 
But like I said, they both contain berberine, which is going to be antifungal and also have antibacterial properties. It has antioxidant properties. It aids in digestion and it has mild laxative properties. Available for, of course, is the dried herb, the capsules, or you can find it as a tincture, or of course, wild harvested. If you are pregnant or breastfeeding, this is not one that is supposed to be used. Next, we're going to be getting into some of the safer herbs. We're getting into the seeds that are part of the carrot family. This is going to include the coriander, the caraway seeds, the fennel seeds, the carom seeds. Uh, celery seeds are also included here, and if I haven't mentioned it, we'll say the cumin seeds. I may have already said that. Regardless, uh, this is the carrot family, which is actually formerly known as the Apiaceae family. And coriander seeds, coriander is also known as cilantro or Chinese parsley. It has been shown to be antibacterial, antiparasitic, and antifungal. The green herb of cilantro is very effective in removing heavy metals and detoxifying the body. There are many forms. You can get the dried seeds. You can actually make it into a tea. You can find it ground and put into capsules. You can tincture this. And of course, you can have the fresh ground seeds. I like this in any ways. I really like the herb of cilantro. It's very good, especially if you eat seafood for making sure that you're not getting any mercury with that. That does pair well with that. Here's some scientific research showing that coriander is effective in dealing with the dwarf tapeworm. Next up is fennel seeds. This has mild but distinctive luxury flavor and fragrance. It aids in digestion. It helps with bloating, indigestion, IBS, and flatulence. It has mild laxative properties and can be an irritate, ir, irritant rather, to certain types of parasites. You can find it in many forms, including the dried seeds as a tea and capsules, tincture, or of course you can grind your own seeds, but you can find it pre-ground as well. Again, I will reiterate that I like to do it myself. Fennel seed tea is very beneficial during a parasitic cleanse. It's going to help calm your stomach and it's very, it's very warming and therapeutic to be having teas when you're doing any detoxification protocols. There's a recipe here that I put together on how you can make fennel seed tea, so if you want to check that out, you can read through that. Caraway seeds. This is also another member of the carrot family and it has a pungent anise-like flavor. Caraway seeds have been used as a digestive aids. They contain volatile compounds that help with being anti-parasitic. You can find it in many forms. That can be the dried seeds as a tea, capsules, tincture, or of course the fresh ground seeds. Caraway seeds are rich sources of essential oils that exhibit many health promoting properties. They're antimicrobial, anti-carcinogenic, that means that they help with uh, eliminating any carcinogenic compounds. That means cancer-causing compounds. They help modulate and regulate the immune system. They have been shown to have antibacterial agents, and they're effective against pathogenic bacteria like H. pylori, and with having no negative health benefits on the bacteria, the good bacteria. And they've been shown to have diuretic properties. So the main volatile compounds have been used as an insecticide, an antibacterial agent and as an antifungal agent. Cumin seeds. You can buy this and you grind it yourself or of course you can just use the whole seed. Cumin is a delicious spice, at least in my opinion. It has antimicrobial, antiparasitic, antifungal, antibacterial, antioxidant, and immune stimulating properties. It's available in many forms including the whole seed, you can find it ground, capsules as an oil, be careful with that. As a tincture or a tea, again, these are all in the carrot family. So as you can see, all of these seeds have similar health benefits, but there are some distinctions. And I wanna make a note that this is not related to the black cumin or nigella sativa, which we'll be talking about in a moment. So next up, we'll be talking about carom seed. And this is also in the carrot family. This is very common in Ayurvedic medicines and this contains thymol just like thyme does, which has been shown to be antiparasitic and also effective against the helminths, which are the worms. In the Ayurvedic protocol, they're using it with jaggery or they're using it with Indian black salt. If you're not familiar with either of those, please check out my video where I discuss that protocol in detail. Carom seed smells and tastes like thyme, but much stronger. It's harsher and it does have some bitterness. Cooking does mellow the flavor, but if you're doing the protocol, of course, you're going to be eating it raw. The available forms, of course, is the dry seeds and the tinctures. Why I limit it to that is because when you grind carom seeds, the volatile oils do diminish very rapidly. I store my carom seed in the refrigerator as well in a dark amber bottle. 
Next is black cumin seed. Again, this is not related to the caraway seeds or to the actual cumin, but this has great health benefits. If you're not familiar with black cumin seed oil, you may want to check into that. I personally don't use the oil. If I did, I would use it topically only, but many people swear by it. Black cumin um, seeds and the oil have been shown to have antibacterial, antiparasitic, antifungal uh, properties, as well as being effective against insects. So it's used as an insecticide. So maybe putting a little bit of black seed uh, oil on with a little bit of oregano oil, that would be a good insect repellent. Maybe putting some lavender in there and maybe some citronella too would be good. It has immune stimulating properties. The available forms, you can get the seed. Of course, you can get the capsules. That can either be the ground seed or the oil. And of course, you can just buy the oil in a bottle. And you can tincture the black cumin. I just eat it as a spice and add it to my soups and grind it up. Neem. This is a natural pesticide. Neem leaf is a great thing. I love neem oil to use topically. I think it smells just it's just amazing. It's a smell that I can't even describe as what it does. And its extracts are very sedative and has analgesic um, properties. Its medicinal compounds are most highly concentrated in the oil and the seeds, but the benefits are still present in the bark and the leaves. Um, I use it as a tincture that I can get. It's very good for your liver. Neem oil from the fruits and the seeds is used for healthy hair and skin. It's just great as a topical um, ointment. Neem is also used in baths. If you could get the leaves, that would be very therapeutic. It helps improve liver function. It helps detoxify the blood and helps to balance blood sugar levels. There's many forms that you can get. You can get the oil, like I stated. That's not for internal use, so be careful and mindful of that. You can get it as capsules or powdered as a loose leaf, as a tincture or fresh leaf if you're lucky enough to live somewhere where neem actually grows locally. Neem has been shown to have antibacterial, antiparasitic, and antifungal properties, and it is a very, very good liver tonic. Sage. Sage is in the mint family. It is commonly called garden sage, common sage, or culinary sage. Many people are familiar with this, especially if they do a lot of home cooking. You can easily grow this as well. It's one of those nice herbs that you can plant in your garden. It has a high level of thujone, which of course is the chemical that is in wormwood that makes it so unsafe. But anyway, the third tone has been effective in killing parasites and it's a powerful relaxant of the muscle lining of the digestive tract, which is very good if we want to be able to relax that to get the, um, the parasites to be able to be moved through our system as quickly as possible. It's closely related to rosemary and they are often called sister herbs. And that's very important because rosemary has been shown to enhance cognition. And here we see that sage has actually done the same thing. It has, uh, sage has been shown to have anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antibacterial, and antiparasitic properties. Available forms, of course, you can have it fresh if you grow it yourself, or you can find it in a store, dried, or you can find rub sage, which is a little bit different. You can find it in capsules, and you can find it ground, and of course, you can find it as a tincture. Next up is century. This is a small plant, and I've never found it in the wild, though I'm going to look this year we need to be really, really careful because if we do research into foraging, we'll find that in the daisy family, there are numerous plants called centauri. These are not the same thing. They're in a completely different family and the ones in the daisy family might be completely unsafe. So be very mindful of that. Uh, this type of centauri has been traditionally used to kill worms. It's also used to aid the liver and kidney in purifying the blood. It's used in the treatment of malaria and it's used to treat fever. The whole herb, that means the entire plant, is used in medicine, and you can find many forms. You can have the dried herb, you can have it fresh if you're lucky enough to find it, and make tea out of it, find it in capsules at your store, or maybe as a tincture. It is a very bitter herb, so it enhances the production of gastric secretions. It has been shown to be antioxidant and very supportive in wound care, and it does have a sedative property. No safety concerns have been noted or um, documented despite widespread use. Now we're gonna look at the opposite because this is a very toxic plant. I do not encourage anybody buying any parasitic cleanse that has male fern in it. I have seen a few parasitic cleanse online, cleanses online rather, that actually have male fern in it. And it is a toxic plant. Improper dosages taken internally can lead to blindness and death. I don't know what those levels are. I don't know what those amounts are. And thus, I think, to be using it for that purpose as a, a to kill parasites is a dangerous activity. I've shown many herbs that are 
relatively safe and many that are extremely safe that can be used in ridding the body of parasites and actually dealing with fungal infections. So I don't believe that there's any reason for using this herb. And as it states here, this type of fern is one that's common in Europe. This is not common in North America. If you learn more about the ferns, you'll realize that most ferns are not even related to each other and most ferns are actually toxic. There is a type of fern called bracken, which can lead to a very serious um, vitamin B1 deficiency, I believe, and that can actually be deadly over the long term. So be very mindful of that. If you are someone that knows about wild foraging, of course you can get the fiddleheads from the ostrich fern, but be very mindful of the fact that there are many ferns out there that are not for consumption. The root in the past was used as an antihematic to expel tapeworms, but it's been replaced by less toxic and more effective drugs. And as we see here, this is toxic in my opinion, and it's not recommended for anybody. Those are my words. But of course, you're free to do whatever you would like to do. And again, I caution that there are some parasitic treatments that include milfern in their blend, and it's also available online from a major retailer. So please be careful with that. Of course, the available forms you can find is a powder, tea, and capsules. There are other anti-parasitic herbs. First, we'll discuss tansy, which has been mm, claimed to be toxic because it has thujone in it, which of course we know is in warm wood and also in sage. Anyway, uh, this has been claimed to cause convulsions and liver and brain damage in high doses. I don't know exactly know what high doses is. Uh, tansy does grow wild where I live, but I've never actually used it. The leaves and the flowers are toxic if consumed in large quantities. Again, I'm not sure what large quantities mean. Does that mean making a salad out of it or does that mean using a teaspoon and making a cup of tea? I don't know. I'm not going to take my chances with it. German chamomile is very safe. It's well known for its calming and soothing properties. It's commonly used for minor digestive complaints such as indigestion, gas, and a lack of appetite. It's also claimed to be effective against intestinal worms. St. John's wort is also a naturally antiparasitic herb and it is a natural blood purifier. It has antibacterial, antioxidant, and antiviral properties. And it also has antidepressant properties. So be careful if you're taking a pharmaceutical antidepressant, you might want to talk to your doctor before you use any St. John's wort because that is kind of an issue with that. St. John's wort is a lovely flower and plant that grows locally on the East Coast. So you might want to learn that plant as well. Allspice has been known to be uh, high in eugenol, but not as high as cloves. But it does have some benefits, so you can also add that to your culinary preparations. Aniseeds has modest anti-parasitic and anti-helmetic actions for mild intestinal parasitic infections. Um, this is not the same as star anise, which is a completely different herb, but a delicious herb nonetheless. Rosemary, of course, has been shown to inhibit foodborne pathogens like listeria and a few others. So keep that in mind that rosemary is very closely related to sage, so that can actually be incorporated into a parasitic cleanse as well. Um, adding fenugreek seeds at the back of this. Um, fenugreek is in the legume family. It's an antimicrobial and antiparasitic agent that fights against malaria, and it's also been shown to inhibit harmful bacteria such as Staphylococcus. It has benefits of being an overall health tonic that supports um, overall health. It aids with inflammation, thyroid dysfunction, malaria. It helps with um, hyperlipidemia and diabetes. It smells and tastes somewhat like maple syrup. It adds a little sweetness, especially to curries and other entrees. In the available forms, you can find it in the seeds as capsules, ground, or in a tincture. It has anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-diabetic, anti-parasitic properties. Next up, we'll talk about cassia bark. This is used orally or rectally for parasitic infection. It's very bitter and it helps stimulate the liver and the gallbladder. It's used as a febrifuge, that means a fever reducer. It's used topically as an insect repellent and it's used for its insecticidal properties. It's used in a number of food products. It's listed as grass, which is generally regarded as safe according to the FDA. One warning, if taken in large doses, this product can irritate the gastrointestinal tract, causing nausea and vomiting. One thing to be concerned about with cassia, it has anti-infertility effects. That could be a benefit for some, but maybe not for others. So if you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant, you would want to stay clear of this herb. 
This herb has antibacterial, antiparasitic, antifungal, anti-tumor, and anti-helmetic properties. The available forms, you can find the dried bark, the powdered bark, the tea, or you can have it find it ground and put in a capsule or as a tincture. Now we're going to talk about another herb. I think this is one to possibly stay clear of. I have never used this one. I can't actually pronounce it, so it's Quisqualis indica, I believe. It's known as Rangoon creeper or Chinese honeysuckle. Decoctions of the root, the seed, or the fruit are used to expel parasitic worms. And seeds from the pod are useful against roundworms and pinworms. It's toxic to the parasite and kills them in the digestive tract. So thus, um, this might be something that someone would want to consider if all else fails or if this is the only thing available. The available forms include a powder, dried seeds, capsules, and a tincture. I give the warning that from the research that I've conducted, this is mildly toxic. You can take that for what it's worth. We know that wormwood, or artemisium absinthium, is supposed to be extremely toxic, and I use that. So again, um, this is known um, to be used in Chinese medicine as well, so if you if, if TCM resonates with you, then maybe you should go see a traditional Chinese medicine specialist and maybe this might be part of the protocol. Here is just a, some information on some natural protection against pathogens and cancer. So we see that common foods like garlic and herbs that we've been discussing, like black cumin, clove, cinnamon, thyme, allspice, bay leaves, mustard, rosemary, saffron, turmeric, teas that includes the green and the black teas, and flaxseed have been shown to have antimicrobial and chemoprotective properties. It's a very good research article. You might want to check it out. I'll be leaving the link in the description. I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope this information was valuable. If you want to learn more and if you want access to member-only videos and post and actual uh, access to some of the PDFs, if you're so inclined and you would like those, I'll gladly send them if you join um, and support me on Patreon. I want to thank everybody. Um, my gratitude and love goes out to everybody. Many of you know that I was personally infected with tapeworms and with intestinal flukes and all of this information that I'm putting together is based on my experiences. When I first found out that I had a tapeworm, I did not know about all these herbs and spices that were anti-parasitic. So I used what I knew and um, it was effective, but it would have been much more effective and an easier process had I known and had all of these uh, herbs to be working with. I wanted to present all of the herbs that I've discovered in one, con well, concise is a loose statement, um, but in one uh, video so people can actually see them and, and know that there's hope out there. And if you're suffering from any strange health conditions, do consider getting tested for parasites. I personally was infected for over a decade and I did seek um, medical care and no doctor ever mentioned the possibility of parasites being the cause of my subclinical hypothyroidism or my hormone disruption or the fact that I was deficient in many nutrients. Um, and in fact, it turned out to be a tapeworm. And by the time that I actually discovered it, it almost cost me my life. I have since turned it around and I'm definitely on the way back and I'm doing, you know, rather well. And I definitely want to share that information because what I'm hoping to prevent is that from happening to somebody else. And knowing that we can get tapeworms from eating sushi, which many of us do, we can get tapeworms from eating beef that's not properly cooked. And by properly cooked, I mean to actually being well done. So if you're someone that eats your beef on the rarer side, whether that be medium or medium rare or even rare, you do risk getting a beef tapeworm. And of course, pork tapeworm is transmitted from humans to humans. So if somebody is infected, they can actually give it to you. And of course, we know that pigs do run through the fields, especially in countries from which we are importing our fruits and vegetables. So thus they can contaminate our fruits and vegetables. So we need to be very um, mindful of that. Of course, we know that cats transmit Toxoplasma gondii, and many people have cats and are very um, unaware that that's even a possibility. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, 30 to 50 percent of the world's population is infected with Toxoplasma gondii. That is a type of parasite that is a protozoan parasite, so you'll never see it. It's a single-celled organism, but it can wreak havoc on your health. It can also remain dormant in your system for many, many years and it'll wait till you're immune compromised before it manifests. That being said, it has been linked to very serious health issues like seizures, it has been linked to headaches and IBS, Crohn's disease. It's been linked to schizophrenic behavior 
and bipolar disorder, suicidal tendencies, and aggressive behavior. These are very serious things, and I think this is something we need to be aware of. And if you have a cat, or you don't even have to have a cat, the whole truth of the matter is, if you go to someone's house and have a cat, the cat can give it to you. Or the fact is, if you're going outside and you have a dog, it seems that dogs like to actually eat cat feces for some bizarro reason. So they can contaminate you that way. So just be mindful of that. I'm not trying to freak anybody out, but this is a reality that we need to face because this is a very serious problem. The other thing that manifested for me was I became very gluten intolerant as well. So if you're someone that all of a sudden, you know, and it was a gradual thing, I don't want to say all of a sudden, but you become the fact you can't eat gluten. They told me I had celiac disease. They wanted to test me. Um, before I was able to get tested, I discovered I had tapeworm. So I decided that that was probably the cause of it. Once I was able to rid my body of the tapeworm, I can eat gluten with no issue whatsoever. So keep that in mind. I'll be discussing uh, the gluten intolerance and the connection to tapeworm in greater detail in a future video. And if you do have any questions about that, you can leave in a comment and that'll motivate me to actually make that video sooner. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. If you'd like to be notified when I put up a video, just hit that bell. If you'd like the video, please hit the like button and please share it with somebody that might benefit from this information. I want to thank you again for your time. And uh, lastly, I would like to say something, but I honestly forgot. This has been a really long video. Again, peace and love to everybody and have a great one. All right. Thanks.